and I'm excited, and I hope you are too. My heart's prayer is that the morning, this morning today, when you leave, you will leap like a calf that has been released from the stall. It says, makkelijker in Afrikaans, so just, so a calf wat bok spring. Have you heard of that saying before? Extreme and utter joy. Complete peace. Peace for every one of you. All because we understand complete and utter, final, right standing with God. That's got zip, nothing to do with you and I. And it's all based on the finished, final, and complete work of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. That the work He's done is so final and complete that you and I can only receive it and respond with joy. Just burst forth in joyous song like Tian led. Have complete peace like Jenny said. And grow in our fellowship with God. The gospel of God is primarily great news. Because there's nothing that can hinder us in our fellowship with God. There's nothing that can separate us. No height, no depth. Neither angels nor demons. Nothing in creation can ever separate us. From this final and complete work of Christ. I pray that if your heart has started to beat slowly. Like that other word we've got. That the heart will start beating. And blood will start rushing through your veins. Because you know. The God who saves me will never leave me. Please turn with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 4. I'm reading the NIV. <clears throat> I love to hear the sound of pages turning. I love reading the actual Bible. I know your Bible is on your phone. That's good. It's wonderful, my love. But I love the Bible. This one I can hold, I can touch, I can mark when God speaks to me because this relationship is living. It's living. I'm reading from verse 1, Romans 4. What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not ever before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift or as grace, but as an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts in God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited as righteousness. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will never count against him. Is this blessedness only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as, credited to him as righteousness. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after but before. 
And he received the seal, sorry, the sign of circumcision, a seal of a righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So then, he is the father of all who believe but have not been circumcised in order that righteousness might be credited to them. And he's also the father of the circumcised who not only are circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. The book of Romans, what a wonderful book. Some people say it's the most influential book in Western civilization. When the great reformers found out that we can only receive right standing with God. What Paul is arguing here is the very heart of the gospel. It's the very gospel message itself is on trial. He's writing into a context where there was Jews and Gentiles. And the Jews were arguing that Abraham was justified by works. That he was not justified by faith. His faith was his works. And Paul saying, there's no way. Romans 4, obviously on the back of Romans 3. And in Romans 3, Paul is arguing that now there's been this righteousness from God being revealed to all who believe in God. Paul said earlier that whether you were before Christ or after Christ, all of your righteousness comes from believing in God. And when Christ came and paid the price on the cross, He justified God who dispensed right standing with Him to all who believe. Even before Christ came. And it's two examples of those who had, had faith in what God was going to do is Abraham and David. Abraham, the people, obviously the father of the faith, called a friend of God, was the biggest name in the faith, in the Israel faith, in the Jewish faith. And Paul is saying that even Abraham was justified before God was brought in complete right standing with God based on what Jesus Christ had done. There's nothing new about the gospel. It's always been God's plan. It's always been Jesus. He's the only name that brings salvation forever to all who believe. But what does it mean? To be righteous. There's two types of words that Paul uses here to describe to us. To help us to understand what righteousness really means. The first word he uses is the word justify. God justifies the wicked. And that is a legal term. It's a term that when you come before the court and the judge is standing there and the accuser brings all his accusations against you and all his proof and the judge declares you not guilty. God justifies the wicked. All of us, are. Abraham was wicked, David was wicked. There's no one who searches after God. No one, all have turned away. But God comes on the basis of Christ's finished work and He declares you innocent before Him. He declares that you have no guilt. That's what righteousness means. To be in the accuser box, knowing everything you've done, and then based on faith alone, to be said, not guilty, sir. Isn't that cause for great joy? Isn't that cause for sleep? 
What a blessing from God. But there's another word which he uses to describe to us. And that word is the word credited. It says God credits righteousness to you based on faith alone. And that word credited, if you did accounting, you'll know you've got debits and credits. And this was the term used in the accounting of the day. That in your balance sheet, that your equity, your ANR's belong. If you have the asset of faith, whether it's this small, God comes and He dumps on the credit side to your good that you are as perfect as Him. You see, this righteousness that Paul is talking about is not righteousness that I can make or you can make or Paul could make or Abraham or David or whoever else you think is great, Mother Teresa. This right standing, this righteousness, this perfection is God's very own perfection. He doesn't give us others. He says, you are as perfect as I am. Because your faith, because you look to the finished work of Jesus. All your wickedness have been removed completely, utterly. It cannot come back to you. This week I was, I was wondering if I should show the video clip. But there's this product uh, on YouTube. You can look at, look at it. It's called Never Wet. So these people, they've, they've somehow formulated a, a, uh, a substance. And if you take the substance and you spray it on you, they did it with their CEO. It's quite funny. So the CEO standing there, they spray the substance, never wet, all over his clothes. And then they come with tomato. So the employees must have loved this. They come with tomato sauce and mustard and chutney and Pepsi cola and all sorts of things that you can imagine and they chuck it on him and this stuff just rolls off it just rolls off and that is the picture that God gives us if we have this little bit of faith God dumps he covers us over with this substance this righteousness this right standing with him that when we come on trial and the enemy comes and he throws this accusation. You're a liar. You're a thief. You're an adulterer. You're a murderer. Look how you look lustfully at that woman. Look how you're coveting your, your neighbor's husband because of his great job and his Mercedes Benz or whatever. All those accusations, when it comes before God, it means zip. It means nothing. It cannot stick. Because you're clothed with Jesus' righteousness. Finally and completely. But if you do not have this faith, what is the only alternative that you have? The only other alternative is works. Is if you don't have this righteousness from God received on you, by nature, human beings try to work out a righteousness of our own. And this, friends, can never be good enough. It can never, ever take away our sin. There's no works. If you try by works to become acceptable to God, it will never, ever work. God says He hates it. He despises it because the price that he paid, all he wants you to do is to receive it. Let's use the example like this. If you have never stolen anything in your life and this morning you go and you steal something and they catch you, but they only catch you 10 years later, but from the moment you stole till 10 years later, you never steal again. 
Does that wipe away that one time when you stole? It doesn't. You need something other than yourself. No works of yourself. All works when it's good. When you do things like come to church, when you read your Bible, when you pray, when you tithe, all these very good things that God wants us to do, we should do. But they never wipe away when we don't. They never wipe away the lustful thoughts of our minds. They can never make up for it. In your balance sheet, you have place for one or two. One of two. You can either have on the debit side faith, which brings righteousness, or works which will bring you condemnation because you always want to do more because when is enough enough? The answer is never. It will never, ever, ever be enough. So whether you use the example of the law courts or of the balance sheet of faith, works will never be enough. Works can never wipe away our wickedness, our sinfulness, our transgressions, even if it's only one. It can never. If you're a bad father, or if you hear of a bad father, and he now starts becoming a good father, wonderful, you're doing what you're supposed to. Doesn't make up for what you did. You need to receive this right standing with God, this righteousness. You need to receive it. And friends, we need to believe it. Our tendency is to receive it, and then for some reason we forget. We receive it with great joy. This, I remember one day I came to the front. There was a recommitment again before God, and I was snot and thrown and crying. I received my right standing with God. I was reminded of it again, and then Monday morning mess up again. And then from Tuesday to Saturday trying to fix this problem by doing all sorts of things and then realize, hey, nothing works and Sunday coming again. Thank you, God, you've forgiven me again. I didn't believe in this utter and complete work of Christ that can never be taken away. It can never, ever be taken away. So what did Abraham find? Was Abraham the perfect example of a righteous life? The answer is yes and no. Yes, because of his faith, but certainly not because of his deeds. Remember what Abraham did. Remember Genesis 15, where God comes, he says, God says, I'm your very great reward, Abraham. And Abraham says, God, what, is it gonna what are you going to give me? Everything I already have, I'm a rich man, is all going to go to Eliezer of Damascus. And God says, look at the stars, Abraham. If you can count them, that's how many times, that's how many offspring you're going to have. He speaks, God speaks, I counted in that chapter eight times about Abraham's offspring. In Genesis 16, Sarah comes. Sarah says to Abraham, Abraham, you know what? God is keeping me from having children. So what is she saying? She's saying God lied. God said you're going to have lots of kids. I don't think so. It's not happening. It's been 10 years. I'm hitting 80 something now. Maybe you should go sleep with the maid. Which was perfectly acceptable in those days, I understand. But for Abraham, it was a problem because he was not doing it out of faith. And that which is not out of faith is sin. And we know that Ishmael was born of that. But not only that, later on, on two different occasions, Abraham is confronted with the kingdom. So he says to Sarah, his wife, he says, Sarah, tell them you're my sister. You're going to bless me. You're going to protect me. God said the second time it happened with Abimelech was a year before Isaac was born. And God said to him, by this time next year, you're going to have a son. His name's Isaac. And in that time, when Abraham is supposed to 
create the baby with Sarah, he rather, for the sake of his own skin, tells the king, no, she's my sister. Now people say, but he, she was his sister, half-sister. But that's not the point. His saying she's my sister was not by faith. It was out of fear. Because the king's going to kill me. Because when I'm dead, he can have my wife. Just as a side thought, how beautiful must she have been at 80-something to be <laughs> so attractive to the king that he'll kill Abram. <laughs> but the fact is, friends, Abram was just like you and me. The only thing that's special about Abraham is that Abraham received right standing with God and he grew in that. He grew strong in his faith talking to God. Realizing when he messed up, he didn't lose his right standing with God. He lost his fellowship with God. But coming then again and realizing I'm still God's friend. Because I've been clothed with righteousness. Who's the second example being used here? David. Remember what David did? Remember how David, having already a bunch of wives, and all the kings that went out to go in for battle, and he stayed alone at the temple, going on top of the palace, and he sees this babe having a bath. On the top of a roof where she's supposed to. And he says, I want her. But he's married already. He's not married to her. And she's married to somebody else. And he sleeps with her and he creates a baby. Commits adultery. She lets him know. King David, we've got problems. My husband is out at war and I am pregnant. It's yours. David says, let me make a plan. Let me make a plan. He says, let me call that husband of yours. He's been a couple of months. Surely he's looking forward to be united with you, his wife. But this Uriah comes to town and he says, you know what? All my friends, they're in the battle fighting. They don't have this privilege with his wife. Why is the king calling me? I can't do this. I cannot betray my friends and take privileges. Why am I special? He sleeps outside the house. David tries to get him drunk so that his righteousness, righteous living can take a little bit of a back seat because you know the inhibitions go when the alcohol comes. Or is it just me who's found that out? <laughs> we all can sit and pretend that we're very... Righteous right here. <laughs> it's not from ourselves, friends. I promise you that. Not one of you. Not me. But this man, even after he's drunk, still refuses to go to sleep with his wife. Still sleeps outside. David realizes I've got a problem. But you know what? The commander of the army is under my instruction. He tells the commander of the army, put your eye on the front. And go up against the city so that Uriah will be killed. It happens. Bathsheba's husband is killed. Set up, hidden as a murder. What it actually was. David was a wicked man. But he cries out before God. Blessed is the man Blessed are they whose transgressions are forgiven. Whose sins are covered. Let me remind you, he was a Christian in our days. He was already believing in God. And then he committed adultery and murder. And still he could cry out, my sins have been covered. He's even more specific in Psalm 51 verse 14. He said, to save me from my blood guilt, O God who saves me, and my lips will sing of your righteousness. Not a righteousness of my own. A righteousness that I receive from God, which I can never lose. 
Later on in Romans, it says, this righteousness is by grace. This promise is by grace so that it may be guaranteed. If righteousness could have been received by works, you could lose it. David would have lost it. But he couldn't lose it because it wasn't by his effort, friends. It was by faith as big as a mustard seed. We are made completely and utterly righteous before God. All on the basis of Christ's final work. His finished work. And Abraham, why is Abraham the father of both the circumcised and the uncircumcised? Because circumcision or works has got nothing to do with it. Nothing. What you do after you become righteous cannot do squat, nothing, to give, make you more righteous. If you already receive God's righteousness, what more do you think you can get? You cannot become more righteous. You cannot become less righteous. You've received it. It's been covered over you. If you've put your faith in God, by nothing you do, simply trusting in God. Simply trusting in God. And he received the sign of circumcision. It was a sign of the righteousness he already had inside him before he got circumcised. You know how old was Abraham when he got circumcised? 99. 99. Ouch, yeah. <laughs> you know when was the first time God called him? He was 75. 24 years he was walking this walk of faith. And then God came to him and says, Abraham, looks like you're battling to remember how righteous I've made you before me. He says, I'm going to help you remember. I'm going to give you a very intimate, close seal. That seal is the authenticity, the proof of this is real, the real deal. I'm going to give you the seal of righteousness so that you, on, in your own body, that you can't forget it. I'm doing my best, Abraham. Abraham, I gave you the stars to remember. I gave you the sand. The very land you're walking on is supposed to remind you with every step that I am the one who clothed you with righteousness. But you still forget, I'm going to give you one in your own body. That's why he was circumcised. Not to become righteous, because he already was righteous. Romans 2 says a Jew is not a Jew is one outwardly and, phys- and circumcision is not merely physical. But a Jew is one who is one inwardly and circumcision a matter of the heart by the Spirit. Which is, by the way, quoted also in Deuteronomy 30. God has only had one plan. All his life, or all, God has always existed, but with all creation only had one plan. And that plan is faith in him. There's nothing else. You cannot attain a righteousness from God, a perfection from God by your own effort. It's impossible. It's impossible, friends. You can only receive it by faith. So how do we know? How do you and I know if we really believe it? The Bible helps us. Verse 4 says, the NIV, I like this translation. It says here, now when a man works, his wages are not credited to him as a gift, but an obligation. However, to the man who does not work, but trusts in God who justifies the wicked, his faith is credited to him as righteousness. The ESV uses there the word believe instead of trusts. But the NIV has grasped, uh, has, has interpreted for us in a way that we can easier understand it. This trusting of God, 
this letting go, this stopping your own effort. I have peace with God. If I trust God, it means I have peace with Him. When I trust God, I say, God, I agree. If I agree with God, He's happy. That's the greatest news. I was wondering this week, on Friday, in preparing this message, I was so incredibly peaceful. I told my wife, I've, yeah, I almost feel guilty. There's so much just peace in my life. And I realized it's because my faith in God, in the area of His righteousness, has been growing because I've been hearing this message the whole week in preparation for today. We receive a peace with God that no mind can comprehend, that guards our hearts before Him. If you don't have peace, the answer is not more works. The answer is coming again before God and saying, God, thank you for my righteousness that you have given me. Thank you that I have peace with you. Not by my own efforts, but only by God. You know, friends, <laughs> we all battle with temptation. I've learned when I battle with temptation, then I... I used to always wonder, you know, the Bible says, everyone, when he's dragged away, enticed by his own evil desires, that's how you sin. So you first get tempted and the temptation grows and then it becomes sin. And previously, I've tried to fight this temptation by first trying to figure out, all right, was this a temptation or did I actually sin? You know what that tells me, my friends? It means I don't understand righteousness because it's irrelevant. It's irrelevant whether it was a temptation or whether it was sin. What is extremely relevant is my response. Am I going to trust today at that moment after the temptation came? Am I going to trust in the complete right standing I've received from Christ or I'm going to try and work it myself? That's what's relevant. You cannot defeat sin in your life by trying to defeat sin. You only defeat sin in your life by agreeing with God and having peace with God that I've received it from Him. I've received complete right standing with God. No effort of myself. All given to me. Closed on me. The Father calls you and He clothes you with righteousness. He calls you perfect. You think I'm not. You think I'm in. I lust and I do this and I lie and I speed and I whatever. Flip the taxi. <laughs> Surely I can't be righteous. God looks at you and He sees Jesus' perfection on you. You cannot earn it. Agree with God. You're going to get peace. You're going to stop trying to earn it. The next thing that's a bit more clear in this part of the text is David speak of the blessedness. Sorry, I'm very thirsty. David speak of the blessedness of the man whose sins are covered. The man whose lawless deeds have been forgiven. That word for blessedness, my friends, is extreme, intense joy. That's what it means. It means you burst out in laughter because God has declared you righteous. There's no more, you're no longer His enemy. You're His friend. You can have fellowship with Him. You can smile. You can believe what God has done. There is absolutely zero reason for a Christian to wake up unhappy. Because we've received peace with God. We received blessing from God. In extreme, intense joy. And lastly, friends, 
we walk in the footsteps of faith. How did Abraham's footsteps of faith walk? How did he walk in his footsteps of faith? Wherever he went, he was thinking about what God said all the time. He was thinking about God's promises. He talked to God. Friends, if we understand how righteous Christ has made us, we receive peace. Once we've walked a bit in this peace, our joy increases. Once our joy increases, man, we want to talk with God. Can you imagine? There's nothing hindering you to be in God's presence. We can celebrate it. But that's only if we've received this righteousness from Christ. And if you have put your faith in Christ, if you believe Christ is the full and final payment of your sins, my friends, you're righteous. You as right as God is. Just if you have never sinned in your life before. It's cause for great joy. No matter if the Springboks lose or the Lions didn't win the final. It doesn't matter. Because I am in right standing with God. Amen.